Now we are looking forward for the first keynote in our conference. And our speaker is Johann Bollen. Um, Johann Bollen is Associated Professor at the Indiana University School of Informatics and Computing. And he's a member of the Center of Complex Networks and Systems and the Cognitive Science Program. So I'm very keen on his speech. And I hope the technique is so far ready. When preparing for this keynote, and I, I didn't know I'd be speaking to you like the, the, the Sun King. Uh, it's actually really flattering. I mean, I hate people being put on a pedestal, including myself, but this is, a, this is taking it to the next level. Um, and as I was preparing this keynote, and I was talking to Marianne, and she said, oh, no, we're not interested in your bibliometric or scientometrics work. No, just talk about Twitter. And to a person like me, that's an open invitation to mayhem. And uh, so what I decided to talk about is uh, our work on using uh, Twitter Moot to predict the stock market. And uh, we just heard about dwindling budgets uh, and the need for uh, bibliometric indicators to prioritize resources, etc. Perhaps, you know, the, uh, the Ministry of Education could simply uh, start uh, putting their bets on the stock market and see if that would work out uh, a little better for them. So I'll, I'll be talking about social networks and uh, I'll, I'll give sort of a very broad overview to some of you that might be insulting uh, or condescending. For some of you, it might be something new. Um, and I'll talk in particular about a work uh, on, on, in the area of uh, social network analytics. Uh, so a friend of mine sent me this uh, XKCD cartoon a while ago. I don't know. It's readable. And it says the, uh, the, percentage, uh, the percentage of the U.S. population carrying cameras everywhere they go, every waking moment of their lives. Right? And of course, this is an imaginary statistic. I don't, I don't think these are actual numbers. But it really struck me that if you look at the ramp up of that curve, it really happened around 2005 and 2006. To me, that's not, not the remote past. That's actually very, very recently. That's a very recent development. And you know, as a 40-year-old as a, as a, as a man is prone to do, sometimes I wax nostalgically about sort of the, the, uh, the, the 40 years that I've been walking this earth. And I started thinking about you know, the, 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 sort of the, the time spans that were, that were all uh, looking at. So I was born in, in 1971, right? And the way that I envisioned that year is just a bunch of naked hippies dancing to psychedelic jam music uh, and, and thinking of conceiving the likes of us, right? Uh, the other better point of view is, of course, Charlton Heston fighting off zombies in a, in a deserted <laughs> New York. I'm, I'm sure that a lot of you know this movie. It's fantastic. Um, but just 10 or 11 years later, uh, this is what I got for... Uh, for Christmas, or actually Santa Claus, as we call it in, in Belgium and, and Holland, which is sort of the, the more wicked version of Santa Claus. Much less jolly, I can assure you. Well, anyway, he brought me this, this ZX81. Can I see a show of hands of anyone who actually knows this computer? Oh, that's great, right, friends. Um, when I received this computer, it was sort of, to me, the cutting edge of anything the computer era had wrought, right? It had one kilobyte of RAM memory, uh, my grandma gave me the 16 kilobyte expansion module that, you, that, that sits right there at the, uh, at the end. Um, and it, it, um, it had a Z80 microprocessor CPU that ran at 8 megahertz. Right? And believe it or not, for my entire duration of programming basic on this little machine hooked up to my television, right, I, ha I was not able to fill that 16 kilobytes of RAM memory with basic code. The reason for that being very simple, because it didn't have any external storage, it was not connected to any network, right? all of the code that I had, a lot of the code was just uh, from Byte Magazine, it was basic code that I just copied painstakingly manually from uh, Byte Magazine. I know this is sort of devolving into a story about how they made us walk to school in shorts with, through two meters of snow, uphill both ways, etc. But this is a fantastic little computer for uh, an 11 year old kid, absolutely fantastic. Uh, but you know, and even back then we realized that that couldn't be it. And if you look at it, and, and this is the worst cliche in the world, right, in computer science, but if you look at Moore's law, I mean, the doubling rate so far, so far of the number of transistors that they, they're able to pack in these microchips have been doubling. So if you, if you look at this graph, I don't know whether my mouse pointer actually will make it to the screen, but I was right here in 1980, uh, in 1981, right? And no one could have thought that we'd 
end up in terms of computational power that far, that many orders of magnitude along that line, right? And that was even before many of us had actually conceived of uh, something called the internet, right? And if you look at the numbers, they're absolutely staggering. I mean, th there's about 7 billion people in the world according to this, this statistic, and a good chunk of them are actually online, have internet access, have become internet users. So all of those ZX81s have not just, uh, have, have not just exploded in power, but now they're all connected on this, this fantastic network through which we can download uh, pictures of cats making funny statements and, and et cetera. Um, Okay, well, that's the second revolution that I've been privileged to witness in my relatively short lifespan, right? But on top of that, we had the likes of Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. We had sort of the social networks uh, making inroads over just the past five or six years. I mean, if you look at the statistics, I don't know whether this graph is accurate or not, but if you look at Facebook, right, the, you know, again, I have to move my mouse pointer. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the amazing ramp up, so recently, 2006, of the number of Facebook users, for it to end up in, in, in literally billions of people, right, is absolutely staggering. And that's not taking into account uh, uh, Twitter, which, which now claims to have at least 500 million accounts, not, not necessarily active users, Pandora, LinkedIn, YouTube, etc. The numbers are, are absolutely staggering. I know there's 7 billion people on Earth, and that's a staggering number, but a good chunk of the world's population right now is on Twitter and Facebook. I'm sure a lot of you are now tweeting about how this keynote sucks. So, mass media. I think that, honestly, if you look at first, you know, we had the explosion of computing power, right? Then we had in the internet, and then we had sort of the, the uh, a layer being poured on top of that, which is the social, the social media infrastructure. I think it's, 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 it's wreaking changes, not um, havoc, not just with our social systems, but also with science itself, and I'll go into that a little bit. Uh, later on, you know, I mean, we're, we're used to, and I'm, I was raised um, having one television channel, one or two television channels at the most, and my dad had to crawl on the roof to adjust the antenna, right? And so that was the basic model. You had one sort of state-owned television channel that broadcast uh, to e um, eager millions, right? There were elections and polls where the information actually traveled the other way, but with the internet, actually, we've, we've decomposed the structure nearly entirely, right? And it's, it's difficult to see how this must not have tremendous consequences for uh, not just how information flows to our society, but also how we govern and, uh, and how we discover new information. I think that the big, um, the tremendous contribution of social media has that, that has created a many-to-many -many, uh, society where, you know, people generate their own content rather than to, con to consume it. Uh, they establish social relations through these networks and they collaborate, they develop, uh, develop both of them, right, in these networks, right? And what we end up with, as I said, is sort of an enormous amount of interactivity and lots and lots of pictures of funny cats. Right? But it's not just pictures of funny cats, because the big power of these networks is that it's not like we're subject, it's not like we're subject to the world's whims, right? We create these ego networks. We choose who to follow. We choose who to friend on Facebook. And I think people should be a lot more careful about their, you know, how they manage their social relations on. Uh, online, but th the one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that these networks are much, much more selective. They're much more restrictive than anything you would see in a public square. Right? If I walk in the streets of Austria, I could bump into thousands of strangers right, that could become friends. Social networks don't work that way. You really carefully construct your own little ego network, your own little bubble of people that you like, that are your friends, that like the same things, etc. I'll go into that a little bit, and that even applies to sort of psychological mood states. Anyway. The echo chamber there is uh, absolutely tremendous. So Facebook and Twitter, I think those are the big sort of social media networks that everybody knows about. Again, a, a huge amount of users. I mean, seriously, 750 million users. That, I mean, that is more than the population of the, of the European Union and perhaps the United States combined. That's just absolutely amazing, right? Same for Twitter. So the, the amount of content generated, the amount of information that flows through these networks is absolutely staggering. Now, the one thing that I always have to, and perhaps this crowd is very different, but the one thing that I always have to uh, sort of dispel is this notion that it's just a bunch of bored teenagers talking about Justin Bieber's latest album. I don't think that's true anymore. And if you look at recent, uh, recent events, uh, I think these environments have had a tremendous effect on the world's democracies, including our own. It's not just in Egypt, in the Arab world, this, is, this has had a tremendous effect on how we, um, how we operate even our Western societies. Um, you know, if you look at the Egypt revolts, you look at the Haiti disaster and the role of uh, social media there, which has been absolutely um, uh, 
amazing. So there, there seems to be some prevailing pessimism about sort of large groups collaborating in a productive manner, absent central authority. But I think it's not justified. I think it's entirely unjustified, in fact. I think these environments are just absolutely fantastically self-regulating, if you think about it. Um, you know, and I say this coming from, uh, from my studies of collective uh, intelligence, right? Um, these phenomena have been described and studied in uh, some of the lesser animals and even insects, right? I mean, ants can be amazingly productive and amazingly collaborative. Right? When you put a whole bunch of them together and they communicate the most basic details about their environment. For example, I found food and now I'm excreting a lot more pheromone on my path to the nest. More ants follow that, that same path that leads them to the food, etc. And before we know it, you have some very organized uh, flocking and herding behavior. And even people are like that when they cross the street. You know, the first person to cross the street, you can see sort of a, an avalanche of people following those people and herding them across the street, especially in areas of dense traffic. There's also quite a bit of uh, theory to support this notion that when you put large groups of people together and you have them vote on a particular issue, the reliability of their judgment actually increases tremendously. I won't go into the mathematics of this, but this, the, the Connorset theorem was, uh, was proven in 1785. So we've known for quite a while that if you have individuals that, in, that individually have uh, a greater than 0 0.5 probability of being right, you put them together and, they, and they, they, they conduct a majority vote. The more people you include in that group, the greater the odds of the group as, as a whole to come to the right decision. And this is for juries. And so that's a very, uh, uh, a very specific proof, but I think it applies to uh, uh, a large number of uh, phenomena. And, and especially online, I think the wisdom of the crowd, as they call it, right? that is large groups of people collaborating, exchanging information can lead to some fantastic results. I mean, we, we, we all know about folksonomies, right? people actually d designing classification systems out of nothing right? by, by, by simply adding tags to documents and then having it self-organized. Um, I think it's been widely shown that Wikipedia can uh, beat the pants off of the um, Encyclopedia, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, you know, it's not something people like to hear. And I, I've heard a lot of people say, oh yeah, but it's on Wikipedia, we can't trust that. Well, I, I think actually we can put a lot of trust in Wikipedia and it's, and it's getting better and better all the time. Um, one of our new faculty members actually, he was, he was just recruited and he's coming to join the School of um, Informatics and Computing, Simon Dedeo, actually show, uh, has published this fantastic pa paper that essentially demonstrates that the editing process of uh, Wikipedia pages exhibits uh, the level of structure that uh, cannot be explained by, uh, by uh, uh, a relatively simple computational process. You have to assume some higher level computation taking place. And that higher level computation is some kind of a collective intelligence that's shaping the, these pages. Now, what I've always been interested in, given that I've got a PhD in psychology, is not so much what people tell me about events or the news that they tell me, the information that they share, but how they feel about the information. Can anybody recognize that animated GIF, by the way? No? No children of the 80s here? That's Morrissey crying in the desert. No, okay, well, it's falling flat. Anyway, I thought this was very funny. Um, <laughs> a little bit of cultural disconnect there. Um, so, I think it was uh, Epictetus that said that men are disturbed not by things, but by the principles and notions which they form concerning things. So essentially what he was saying is it's not really what happens. It's not really the news, and not, it's not the thing. It's how we evaluate it, right? And it's absolutely true that we've shown that collective intelligence seems to work, work really well in designing uh, uh, collective encyclopedias. But I'm not so much interested in knowledge, I'm actually uh, interested in how people feel about that knowledge, right? If there's an earthquake and we, you know, we shrug it off and we act like nothing happened, you know, I mean, it's still a bad thing, you know, you can hope that no one died. But at the same time, how we, how we assess the consequences of that earthquake really matters tremendously in our response to it, how the markets respond, etc. But how can we determine uh, feelings from online text? And so this is where we go from collective intelligence to collective feelings, to collective mood. Um, people have actually designed some really amazing algorithms to look at a piece of text and make an assessment of the mood or sentiment that that text uh, uh, exhibits, right? Uh, I'll give you, a lot of people have used nexic, uh, lexicons for this, you've got the effective norms for English words. It's a whole bunch of Engli English words where human subjects essentially said, well, this is a sad word, this is not a sad word, etc. Thousands upon thousands have been uh, rated that way. And then what you do is you simply look at a text, there's one right here, I'm totally coveting seafaring ways, my dream is oceans of bed, I, I don't even know what that means. Um, 
But if you match the new words in the lexicon to this, and then you aggregate the ratings for all of these words, you can kind of determine whether a text is particularly sad or particularly happy or indicative of an anxious mood, etc. Right? And of course, um, I, I won't go into the machine learning approaches, etc. But uh, clearly, you don't have to use lexicons. You actually train computers to actually look at a piece of text and, and give you an indication, more or less, of whether that text is particularly happy or sad. It's very difficult to do for individual tweets and individual text, but it certainly works to some degree for larger text. Now, now I'm bringing all of this together, hopefully. Right? I've been rambling a little bit. We've got social media. We, we've got petabytes of text being generated online by these large groups of individuals. Right? We have the algorithms to analyze that text, not just extract information from it, but extract indications of uh, the, uh, the collective's mood state from that uh, uh, from those pieces of text. And we can do some amazing things when we do that. I mean, here's an example of a graph. This was done by uh, 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 Dodd, who essentially charts the world's mood state over time from analyzing tweets. So they, they can do this in real time, you know, every minute, every five minutes, every hour. And essentially what you see is, I mean, these little, little squiggles here, uh, these little squiggles here are just sort of the weekly signal of people getting happier on the weekend and sadder. When Monday comes around, right, you see big spikes around Christmas and New Year when everybody's happy. There's a soccer game. People get really excited as well. Um, you know, it's absolutely uh, fantastic animations that have been produced by some people where you can actually see the mood state of the United States shift uh, across time zones. As the sun rises in the east, people start to perk up. They get happy on the east coast, right? And then the sun passes over the United States, and then the tweets get happier and happier on the east coast. Everybody gets tired, and they get down again. And then the sun hits the west coast. And things go crazy, of course, right? because it's the West Coast. Um, anyway, so we can essentially track sort of the pulse of the world's mood state, how people essentially are doing from one minute to the next by analyzing these very large scale texts where people are exchanging information about earthquakes, about Bernanke saying something dumb, et cetera, et cetera. And where they, they are evaluating that information to the best of their knowledge, changing, uh, exchanging those evaluations, and we can track that information. So, what we have done in this area, and this is a shameless plug where I'm going to tell you a little bit about our research where we showed that we might be able to actually predict stock markets from this kind of data, is that we, we were looking at the financial market as, as a big mood ring. It's, I, I think it's, it's, it's indisputable that the financial markets to some degree are driven uh, not just by greed but also by fear. And if we've been able to measure that fear, perhaps we can get it an edge on the stock markets to some degree, right? A lot of people think this is impossible, but we've got some data that we think could shed some light on this. The data set that we use for this particular publication, or I, I won't spend too much time on this, um, uh, was a pretty old data set, was complete. An old tweets from 2008 that we analyzed, right? And what we did is we, we used one of those text analytics algorithms to uh, measure six moods, right? Where people are particularly calm versus anxious, alert, sure, vital, kind, and happy these six mood states, right? And we essentially took these tweets, piped them through this uh, text analysis algorithm, and out came a bunch of squiggly lines, time series, that told us how people at any particular point in time were feeling, according to the Twitter universe. The results, they're really staggering, right? I mean, we could we can actually see the, uh, the American elections taking place in 2008, where a lot of people were uh, quite happy that uh, Obama was elected. Um, they were also... Um, very happy on Thanksgiving, Christmas, etc. So a lot of phase validity there. But 2008 was also the year where the markets dropped uh, 30 or 40 percent. It's a really scary time. I mean, for most of that, because as an American, you know, most of our retirement savings are locked down in these 401ks, right? And this essentially we're betting on the stock market to make sure we have any any type of retirement. And you know, I was I, did, I was kind of looking like this guy here uh, in, in that period of time. Everybody's really, really anxious, and we were hoping that that signal would show up on Twitter, right? Um, I won't go into the specific methodology, but we, we did actually try to correlate these time series to market fluctuations of Dow Jones Industrial Average specifically, and we found some amazing results. We found that they actually correlated quite well. But it didn't just correlate quite well. They correlated three days ahead, three or four days ahead of time, which is absolutely amazing. And this effect is, uh, has actually held up for uh, uh, quite a bit of time. So, I mean, think about this, right? You got 200, 250 million people chat, chatting um, about Justin Bieber on Twitter. We analyzed their mood states. Perhaps they hated his latest album. And somehow it has some kind of predictive information with respect to the stock markets. 
I think that's a fantastic result. It's absolutely staggering. I mean, there's people online that have blogs dedicated to how much they hate this result, but I think it's pretty solid. There's lots of other results that actually show that if you analyze the mood of, of a very large-scale population, uh, on, on, uh, population of online individuals, that you can actually uh, find tremendous correlations with the fi financial markets, really strong correlations. Um, you know, Spreng has done some great work. Tobias Price is actually, um, uh, he's, he'll be working with my PhD student after she graduates. Uh, this fall has actually shown that even Google Trends can be used to some degree to predict stock market fluctuations. So when people start searching for uh, debt or ruin, right, then sh shortly after, afterwards the market seems to shift. But then the question is, and this is something, again, where I'll talk a little bit about my research, and then I'll go into something that Mariana specifically forbade me to talk about. Um, so where does the online collective mood come from? Because this is very strange, right? Why would there be any collective mood, right? And we're all rational people. If I stub my toe, that doesn't hurt you. It's not like you stubbed your toe. It doesn't make you sad. So why would there be anything but like collective mood, right? And when I'm talking about collective mood, I'm just not, not adding up sort of the, the general boredom <laughs> I'm reading from your faces right now, uh, but I'm talking about sort of a, a genuine collective mood state where the, the collection of individuals creates something like, not like Wikipedia, but the Wikipedia of mood, so to speak, where we develop a collective joint mood, sort of a zeitgeist like mood, right? Is that possible? Well, people have actually been working on some really sophisticated models that show that mood might be contagious. So when I'm really happy, people around me might be a little happier and vice versa. Right? It could be like uh, the flu, right? And that's why I always try to be as happy as possible, hoping that it has some kind of contagious effect. It doesn't, though. Um, anyway, so a lot has been written in social network analysis, and I don't know whether I spell this, homophily, right? We call it the sortativity in, in, in network analysis. But it's sort of this idea that when you put people in social networks, they tend to, um, they tend to connect. They tend to connect with people that are like them. It's a very sorry sort of result, if you think about it. People cluster according to nationality, ethnicity, religion, race, uh, age, right? In these online social networks, they create their own little ego networks, and these networks are amazingly well clustered according to these particular features. We call it a mafia in social networks, or a, you know, birds of a feather phenomena. In uh, network analysis, they call that a sortativity. And funny enough, in online networks, people have actually been able to show that this is sortativity, also applies to degree. High degree individuals tend to aggregate with high degree individuals. <laughs> That's a really funny result if you think about it. But it's, uh, it's pretty solid. Now there's networks that have the opposite of assortativity, there are disassortative, that has to be the case, right? Here's an example of disassortative mixing in, uh, in social networks. This is a dating network. The, uh, the uh, pink dots are girls, I think, the blue dots are boys. And since most people are heterosexual, not all, but most people are heterosexual, you'd expect a high degree of disassortativity in a network like this, right? And if you look around, there's actually, uh, there's actually some, some guys here that have been amazingly successful, uh, you know, uh, and some girls, and then for most of them, you know, a few pairings, but not much more. And there's a few homosexual ones here as well. Um, the funny thing is that colleagues of mine at uh, Indiana University running the Truthy, uh, uh, website, you should really look into that. It's, uh, they've got a beautiful website. They've actually shown that this kind of homophily um, actually applies to uh, politics as well. Liberals and conservatives in the United States, apparently they follow each other on Twitter, they befriend each other on Facebook, and then they have like a little echo chamber where they talk about how bad the other group is and how, how they much they hate Mitt Romney, and on the other hand, you know, they, they hate Obama. And, but there's very little crosstalk between these two groups. The level of homophily is actually astonishing. And you can actually see it in the mentions and the retweets. So they retweet each other's tweets, and then they mention each other. Right? So it's the mention links that, that span these, these political blocks online, which I think is really funny as well. Okay, so now the question. You know, I've, 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 you know, I've, I've built a clock to tell you the time. But the question that we were concerned with, does this actually hold for online good as well? Does, does a sort of activity apply to online good? So here's what we did, and this is, this is where we get into NSA level uh, spying. Um, even though we, uh, all of this data was anonymized and there's no spying involved. But you can clearly see how this kind of research could be uh, very useful. Uh, so we took another data set, again Twitter, and we tracked uh, about 5 million users over 6 months. We recorded every single one of their individual tweets. And um, we turned the Twitter follower network, which is not a real social network, it's about who you follow, not who you like. Right? So it's not really a social network like we understand it. So we turned it into 
a friend network by assuming that friends have reciprocal followings, right? And then we uh, calculate the Jacquard index of the friend sets to have some kind of a weight attached to that link. Uh, we only took users that tweeted more than one tweet per day, so we had sufficient coverage. Uh, we ended up, after all of this filtering, with about 100,000 users, uh, two and a half million edges, more or less. Right? I won't go into this because I'll run out of time. And then we calculated these individuals' subjective well-being based on their tweets. So we took all of their tweets that they posted over six months, and we counted the number of tweets that contained happy words versus the number of tweets that contained unhappy words. And that ratio we deemed to be that individual's subjective well-being, how, how good they felt about life, because it's a six-month longitudinal study. Right? Here's some examples, high subjective well-being users. My beautiful friend, I love your sweet smile and your amazing soul. It makes me cry. That's a very, very happy tweet. Now, low subjective well-being users, you can clearly uh, see that these are very unhappy people. Some of them are actually embarrassingly unhappy. I don't know why they're on Twitter. Uh, someone should tell them to, to stop posting tweets um, because they're just too sad. Um, the subjective well-being distribution of, of all of these users was a little uh, surprising. It's actually bimodal, which is already indicative of something weird going on, right? You'd expect like a nice Gaussian where people's subjective well-being kind of fluctuates. It kind of doesn't. You know, you get like two peaks, sort of a group of relatively unhappy users and then a group of relatively happy uh, users. And then we calculated the assortativity in this network. And what we did is for every single user, for every two users connected by an edge, right, we grouped all of that data together, giving us two vectors of sort of source and targets of these, these edges in our, in our friend network. And then we correlated their subjective well-being states, right? And that correlation is an indication of whether people that are connected in this network actually have a similar subjective well-being value. And they do, very strongly. And you can cl see, clearly see how bimodal this distribution is. So on the, on the x-axis, we've got the source users. On the y-axis, we've got the target users. Uh, subjective well-being, and you can clearly see some of these nice two clusters of users, the unhappy ones and the happy ones nicely clustering. So what this shows is that we have a very high degree, I won't go into the neighborhood assortativity, but, but this, this indicates that people actually, when I have a particular sub subjective well-being state, and I take the average of all of the people I know, that average will also be correlated to my subjective well-being. Uh, and that's kind of surprising as well. Um, I'm slightly running out of time, and um, just as a quick comment on this result, what this result shows is that, yes, people do have collective mood states, but it's not evenly distributed. They actually flock, they seem to flock together to some degree, I don't know, based on their mood stuff, on their, on their subjective well-being. We don't know whether this is a, a contagion process, whether this is a homophilic process, whether this is a sortativity or not. Right? It could be that I join a happy group of users and then I get happier. It's possible. Right? Uh, so we don't know how to distinguish these two, and that's, that's a really a, a very active research area for us right now. now Okay, on to the stuff that Mariana told me not to mention, and she was, I'm still going to do it. Um, oh, sorry, Mariana. We've also actually, <laughs> we've also looked at Twitter mentions of scientific papers, and I think, and then now suddenly I, I will peek here and just go, ooh, little bit metrics. Enough with the stock market prediction stuff. Um, so what we did is very simply, this is after I published, I'm a, I'm a big fan of open access publishing. Honestly, I'm not a big fan of peer review. I'm not a big fan of journals. I think people should just publish everything. And then everyone can read what they want, comment on it online, and then we know what the best papers and scientists are. That, that's sort of my radical view of science. I know I'm going to be lynched after this talk now, but that's kind of how I feel about things. Um, this Twitter mood predicts the stock market paper is one of my best cited papers. I put it up on the archive preprint. Right? It had 50,000 downloads about a week later. A lot of people read it. There were hundreds of blog posts that, that, that took apart the mathematics and the statistics that commented on it. This paper was much better reviewed than the journal could have ever reviewed it by the time I actually submitted it to the journal. Right? So was it published? Yes. Was it reviewed? Yes. Was it read? Yes. So it's good enough. Anyway, so that inspired me to actually look at Twitter mentions of, of, of scientific papers. We looked at their downloads and archive as well. And then we looked at the citations, the very early citations that they received six or seven months later, about a year after they were posted on archive. The correlation was actually very high, surprisingly high. Right? We did a, a linear regression analysis, which showed that uh, Twitter mentions are actually quite strongly correlated to, to later citations. They're not so s uh, strongly correlated to downloads, though, which is a little surprising, but that could have been a statistical fluke. 
clearly need more research. That's a pretty surprising result. Right? So I actually looked on, on, on Google Trends and, um, and looked up bibliometrics and, and then looked at social network and social network analysis. Can you see the difference between those two curves? Right? I think something is afoot. Right? And, and this is where I get into discussion. I think something over the past 40 years, something amazing has happened. Right? Uh, naked hippies and fighting off zombies after the apocalypse is well behind us. Billions of people are connected online right now. They're tightly connected to very sophisticated online social networking tools and crowdsourcing tools. This is creating what I see, and this is what science to some degree is, some, some kind of a collective intelligence that is much more effective, could be much more effective than many of the systems of scientific publishing and scientific communi uh, communication that we've put into place over the past uh, century. I think this has tremendous implications, not just for social science, for finance, but also for economics and infometrics. Right? Um, for me personally, it's, I, I see this as a golden age of computational social science. As a psychologist, it's really interesting to do controlled experiments. But these data sets give us a, sort of a, a, a very nice, sort of, I wouldn't call it a microscope, a microscope. That's what Kathy Berner uh, calls them, into society as a whole, which also allows us to study uh, scientific communication. And that's something I, I've become uh, really enthusiastic about. Um, I think I've run out of time. I've got two minutes. I've been rambling for about an hour. Um, I just want to quickly point out that this whole idea of sort of a global collective intelligence, a global brain, isn't entirely new. Uh, my, my former advisor, Francis Heiligen, and I actually worked quite a bit on this whole notion that when humanity gets fully connected and starts to interact at the level that we're, we've now become uh, connected, we might see the emergence of something a lot larger than just 7 billion people chatting out Justin Bieber and, uh, and funny cats, we might actually see a global system that uh, acquires an intelligence more or less of its own. And I'm very curious to see how that will, uh, will turn out. Uh, that's about all I have. That's me dropping the mic. And uh, I thank you for your attention. You've been very patient. Thank you.